Hey everyone, this is Jay, also known as Jay Nemesis over on eToro, where I trade as a popular investor. This is our weekly update for week 44 of 2018. Kicking off the news this week, we have BlizzCon. So BlizzCon, for those of you that don't know, is the biggest event run by uh, Blizzard, uh, part of Activision Blizzard. And normally this event is used to kind of show off the latest updates and new characters and things in their games, and of course announce any new big titles that they are working on. Uh, in previous years, we've seen some some really big stuff. Diablo 3, StarCraft 2, Overwatch, of course, was, was absolutely huge. This time, the headline thing that was announced was a new Diablo game. So the new Diablo, Diablo Immortal, was announced. It is a mobile game um, that is being produced in partnership with NetEase over in China. So on the surface, that may seem pretty normal, but there was, in fact, massive, massive backlash by the community, both at the event and then all over the internet following this news. So they made it the final piece of news, um, the final announcement of the show, effectively. And the real backlash comes for a couple of reasons. So first of all, it's not a PC game, and most Blizzard titles are on PC. Uh, in fact, it's been a very long time since they've made a title not available on PC. When asked about this by the audience, uh, they specifically said that they do not plan to bring this game to PC, and they were in fact booed by their audience for the first time ever at a Blizzard event, as far as I'm aware, or a BlizzCon certainly. Uh, in fact, one person actually asked if this was just an out-of-season April Fool's joke, which then went viral online. Um, there have been reports of uh, Blizzard actually trying to manipulate the upvotes and downvotes on uh, the YouTube trailer releases for the game and all sorts of drama around it. So the whole situation is pretty, pretty crazy. Um, luckily, I obviously I'm speaking at the end of Monday now recording this video. Um, I suspected that we would see some backlash in the stock price, and that is what we saw. But it's not all bad news, in my opinion. So the interesting thing about this is that actually I think the game makes a lot of sense on mobile, and I think that there is a very big market for it. Um, the only other mobile game that Blizzard really has is Hearthstone, which is kind of a bit quiet these days. Um, Diablo is actually a game that I think can fit reasonably well on mobile. It's going to be pretty cheap for them to make. And importantly, I think it's going to go down very, very well, especially in Asian markets. So while the news is pretty uh, bearish and the community is uh, pretty angry about this at the moment, realistically, there's not that much for them to be angry about. They're angry because a game is being made on a platform that they, they don't really like and they see it as uh, Blizzard selling out. It happens to pretty much every gaming company these days, and I, I'm pretty sure that in a few weeks' time, this entire situation will have blown over and Blizzard share price will have recovered again. Um, that being said, you know, it's that they've certainly made a splash with this news, right? That it's it's on every single gaming news website. It's all over social media. Uh, I don't see that as a particularly bad thing, given that we've just had the biggest game launch in probably the last two or three years at least. Uh, in Red Dead Redemption. So for Blizzard to be taking headlines, even if it is in a slightly more negative light, is still probably a good thing. There are a lot of people that are going to be aware of this game now. Next up, we have the Bitcoin Cash fork. So uh, Bitcoin Cash has obviously been around for some time now. It was forked off of Bitcoin originally. And when it was originally forked off Bitcoin, there was a piece of code effectively that made the mining algorithm automatically adjust downwards to try and promote people mining on the cryptocurrency. This was never planned to be in the cryptocurrency long term, uh, so a hard fork was planned. What's interesting about this hard fork is actually that some of the core influential groups within Bitcoin Cash, such as Bitcoin ABC and Bitcoin Satoshi's Vision, actually disagree about this issue and a few others. So it seems very plausible that we could see a second chain survive, maybe even a third chain survive, off of this fork, and Bitcoin Cash could actually fork three ways. As a result, there's obviously been a lot of speculation. Personally, I'm not going to be uh, participating in this pump and dump. Um, I think that probably it will still settle back to one chain, despite all of these various different efforts to kind of uh, splinter off into slightly different groups like the Satoshi's Vision Group and, and things like that. 
Um, so I'm I'm kind of bearish on the situation. It's very, very hard to get these pump and dumps right. eToro is usually one of the later exchanges to actually re-enable trading, by which point the price has already changed and you can't really benefit from the situation. I'm expecting a pretty big sell-off um, from this event. Perhaps I could have ridden the wave up and, and sold a bit by now already, but I'm not really convinced that it was what it's uh it's something that's really worth the risk. Finally, the earnings reports continue to slowly trickle in. Uh, we actually have a lot more coming up this week, as you'll find out in our, uh, I guess, upcoming bit at the end of the video. But this week we had both Spotify and SolarEdge. So Spotify's call was actually kind of interesting. It's the shortest earnings call I've listened to so far. It was 30 minutes long. There were several points at which Spotify basically responded with no comment. Um, on a few things surrounding financial situations and uh, the potential purchase of uh, another company. Um, so it's 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 weird because they've been pretty cagey, I think, in how they've handled things. That being said, I'm still pretty bullish on Spotify overall. I still think that they've got a pretty good business model and their heads are in the right place. Um, a couple of analysts kind of expressed some concern about how much time Spotify was spending uh, focusing on uh, discoverability and things. But I think actually that's the right choice and that's the thing that's going to set them apart is effectively trying to help people discover new music. Um, on top of that, they spent a lot of time recently working on the the other side of things effectively. So working on tools for the artists to help the artists get discovered more and give them a bit more control about how they publish music to the platform. As for Solar Edge, uh, it was a pretty good quarter for Solar Edge actually. Um, Although you know they have been having these ongoing problems with uh, the supply in China, uh, generally speaking, they've been performing pretty well, and you know the, I believe their revenue is up forty-two percent year over year. So things are actually still looking pretty good for Solar Edge, despite the fact that their share price has suffered a bit recently. One thing that the uh, the analysts on the call did kind of express some concern around was the uh, recent uh, acquisitions that have been made by Solar Edge. So they acquired a company that makes uh, universal power supplies and things like that. They've um, been kind of working more towards this idea of providing uh, batteries and UPS on the side along with uh, their solar panels. Uh, the big concern with this is that they're trying to compete with some very big players such as LG and Samsung. But I think it's a sensible decision because realistically, that is the way that the market's going to go. We're getting to the point where both residential and commercial usage of uh, solar now kind of has to involve battery power uh, of some description, even if it's on a household or if it's a giant solar farm, both of them kind of want local storage uh, available for that power. So I think it's the correct move. It may be difficult and it may be a bit expensive to try and get the ball rolling and kind of get the right products out um, and the competition is going to be difficult but i think it's the correct choice to make and i would rather have them try and do that um, and possibly not get it quite right than not even try and go for that pie our trading stats for this week we have a 5.7 percent portfolio change to the plus side into the green we have a realized loss of minus 1.86 percent and 39 trades were closed in total 27 of, them, of those trades were profitable, 12 were unprofitable, and our most traded asset this week was AMD again. So again, not too much to see on the crypto side. I closed one trade of EOS for 0.19% profit. Uh, again, this was basically just freeing up more funds to enable my day trading, uh, which I touched on last week. So on to the stock recap. Before I kind of dive into the uh, stocks one by one, I just kind of want to give an overview of uh, how my trading strategy is evolving and kind of being tested a little bit at the moment. So after last week and the week before where I've had some problems with stop losses uh, triggering that I didn't want to trigger and uh, kind of being forced to close a few heavy reds simply because I just don't have the funds available to do day trading or to try and buy the dip in situations where the market has dropped substantially uh, i decided to close out a bunch of positions and kind of start playing around a bit more with day trading to see how i do and uh hopefully work on uh some better stop loss um mechanisms for me to use to effectively kind of manage those more efficiently so the stop loss thing as you'll find out through throughout this didn't work great this week um i still had i think three uh stop losses that that hit which were pretty pretty major ones 
but uh, my day trading was very, very successful. So I, I am kind of happy that I closed a few of those positions, even though they weren't at the best prices to help enable that and facilitate that. Um, the other thing that I kind of want to talk about is the how the day trading has been going. So in total, I did 27 uh, day trades, and I classify a day trade as anything that's under 72 hours in length. There were a couple that were kind of just over that, which were, I think, kind of meant to be day trades, but effectively, I just left them over open like an extra day or whatever. Um, but generally speaking, it's been going very, very well. I only closed five of those in red. Um, some kind of unique circumstances re regarding earnings around a few of those um, and a couple of positions that were affected by the news cycle. Um, but for the most part, all of the other, you know, all of the majority of the positions by a long way were profitable and to a reasonable level as well. You're talking like two, three percent as the average. All in all, those positions did come out in a profit, which is obviously obviously good news. It wasn't a huge profit, but it was a profit of around 0.015% of the entire portfolio. So on a weekly basis, that's not great, but it's not bad. It does mean that, you know, with compounding interest and potentially a bigger balance to be working with, we could be looking at somewhere in the region of 1% to 2% profit per month from the day trading alone, which I think is pretty reasonable, to be honest. Um, so I'm going to continue to experiment with that a little bit more um, in the coming weeks and see how that goes. Obviously, as I said, we are in the middle of an earnings period, so things are a bit more crazy at the moment. And there are going to be some day trades that are really big in one direction or the other. But for the most part, um, things are looking up on that side for the moment. On the stop loss front, I didn't really do as well as that I, I should have done and really needed to do this week. So I'm kind of going to attempt to double down on my efforts on that uh, next week. So the goal here really is to have a week where I just don't close anything more than a 10% loss at all anywhere in my portfolio. Um, I want to do that for a few weeks in a row, see, see how things are going. Um, obviously, you know, the markets are going to move how the markets are going to move and I may be forced to to take action in some situations but I think that we're on a good track at the moment. Okay with all that said and done let's actually take a look at the trades that I did this week. So first of all AMD 10 profitable trades and one loss. So AMD was my most traded. I did a lot of day trading on this um, 10 in fact all of which were profitable. Uh, profits were between 0.8% and 2.89% profit the single loss trade was a stop loss that hit at minus 59.17%. And I, again, I was very, very upset that this stop loss hit because it was a, a frankly pretty bad price. Um, so uh, it is what it is. Um, you know, I'm going to move on and just try and make sure that we recoup those losses. Square, one, one trade here for 4.92% profit. This trade was uh, another day trade over less than 24 hour period. Snapchat, four shorts here. Three of those were very profitable, 12.3%, um, 6.44%, and 0.33% profit. Uh, there was, unfortunately, again, this is the second of those bad stop losses, uh, a loss at, that hit in at minus 50%. And the frustrating thing about this one, actually, was that I was, genu I was genuinely trying to update the stop loss on my phone, and I pressed update, and then it didn't work, and I went back to my profile, and the position had been closed. Um, so that one, I guess I was a little bit more unlucky on, um, the market was moving pretty wildly at the start of the week, especially. So, but, uh, regardless, some, some solid trades on Snapchat there anyway, uh, they don't quite make up for that loss, but you know, it helps, helps a little bit. Next up, we have the NASDAQ 100. So obviously I'm trading this a little bit more, uh, along with a few other, uh, indices, exchanges, whatever you want to call them at the moment um, as a result of the uh, ongoing kind of sketchy situation, let's say, with the economy uh, as a whole. So seven trades here for a profit of uh, between 0.14% and 4.41%. Uh, two of the trades were also at a loss, um, minus 11.03% and minus 9.02%. Uh, so again, I've been trying to actively trade this. It's not the kind of thing that I normally trade, so it is a little bit more difficult. I'm a little bit more reliant on technical indicators, uh, but I kind of left with an okay, okay-ish position, slightly worse than break even. Um, not great, but not a bad price uh, to pay to have some exposure um, on the short side and effectively hedging the portfolio. 
Next up, we have Etsy, uh, three day trades here, all of which were profitable. 4.21%, 1.44%, and 1.79%. Uh, Etsy have their earnings, of course, coming up towards the end of this week. Facebook, uh, I did go for a, a small short position on Facebook, which didn't go the way that I planned it for it to go, unfortunately. So we did make a loss there of minus 6.75%. Uh, I also attempted a short on the DAX, which, as you can see, again, moved against me. Um, so we kind of cut that off relatively early for a minus 2.86% loss. On to page two, starting with Twitter. So we had one long position closed at minus 26.66% and one short position closed for plus 2.54% profit. So the position that was minus 26.66, maybe you're asking, why did I close that? The answer is pretty simple, really, which is that my one of my theories on what's going on with the market is that we're effectively seeing a dead cat bounce where we bounce back up to that 200 moving average on the NASDAQ and then potentially fall away again if there is some more bad news to come. Um, that hasn't really played out too much at the moment, but I think that it was a sensible decision, especially given Twitter's strong earnings to close this position and help you know, free up some funds and potentially get back in later at a better price. I also shorted the SPX 500. Uh, this one was another day trade, I believe, for 1.64% profit. Uh, I also attempted a trade, a day trade effectively, or a swing trade perhaps, I guess you could call this one, on Google around their earnings. Uh, this one, again, went against me. It was on two times leverage, so uh, effectively the, the swing that happened in Google was doubled for me, which resulted in a minus 18.17% loss, unfortunately. Another trade in Tesla. So Tesla's a, a stock that I actually want to try and rebuild a few more positions for the long term in. Not big exposure, but at least like, you know, maybe 2% of the portfolio or something like that. Um, I did open a position, but it was during one of the much more volatile days at the beginning of the week. And I was a bit unsure if now was the right time to do it. So I decided to actually close it again uh, later that same day at a minus 3.14, which is pi. Uh, <laughs> percent profit or loss even sorry in hindsight probably could have held this position open um, perhaps i made the decision to buy into this posi position a little bit too hastily um, given that i changed my mind a little bit later during the day uh, but at the same time it wasn't a massive loss and i don't feel too bad about it because the markets were really really volatile at the beginning of this week so um, it really could have gone either way Amazon. So Amazon is kind of similar to Twitter in a lot of ways. Um, it was effectively, you know, taking this this cash back out again so that we could, you know, have extra funds available to day trade with. Uh, likewise, Qualcomm uh, minus seventeen point six percent. Very very similar to what I was doing with Amazon and Twitter. So again, kind of taking some money out of positions that I wasn't super confident on, at least in the short term. Um, and using it to free up some funds so that I could potentially trade elsewhere. Finally, the last trade was First Solar, which was a loss of minus 51.31%. Again, this was another poorly managed stop loss. Uh, not super thrilled by, by how that went, but um, it's happened now. So I just need to make sure that I stop these stop losses from kicking in in future. Heading over to the performance tab, and we actually have a very small amount of green on the screen again. Um, so November portfolio change is up by uh, plus one point two five percent. The week uh, this week forty four up by five point seven percent, which is uh, nice and good to see. Unfortunately, uh, November to date is down by zero point two one percent. Although I should specify that it is now up again. Uh, but at the time of measuring, it was down. Realized trades uh, for November to date so far, which is not very long, 0.21% um, down. And likewise, for week 44, minus 1.86%. Again, primarily due to those, uh, those few big stop losses and some of the other positions that I did decide to cut myself. So not great, but moving into week 45, and I'm feeling like... I've got to make this a green week, otherwise I'm gonna I'm gonna absolutely be kicking myself. So uh, I'm very very confident that I can turn week 45 green for us, at least on the realized side of things. So looking forward, uh, again as mentioned previously, I'm going to continue to work on our strategy for stop losses. Um, I'm actually looking at effectively. 
uh, setting up alarms throughout the day so that I am checking every stop loss on every single position three times a day now, uh, because apparently two times a day isn't enough. Um, uh, I mean, sometimes I check it more than that as well. Uh, but yes, yeah, so that's that's the action that I'm taking um, moving into this next week, I think. Uh, my goal here really for November is to basically not close any big red trades. So anything over like 10% is, is you know, off the cards as far as I'm concerned. Um, and this is really an effort to try and get everything back under control and wrestle this back under control and, and just kind of accept that, like, I think we've got a good amount to be working with now. It's not necessarily ideal. As I mentioned earlier, I would quite like to have maybe 20% of my portfolio free for doing day trading with, but we currently have around 10% free. Uh, so it's not as high as I would like it to be, but it is uh, a good start. And I think that we can help work towards that, especially with the way that the markets are going with with earnings coming up as well. Big AMD event, which I'm about to talk about. Um, I think there is potential to free up a bit more of that for the day trading and effectively to use as a safety net for when things go against us. I mentioned earnings there very briefly. So we have some uh, another big week of earnings basically coming up. We had two last week, which I am writing up, by the way. So uh, that will be available on my website at the same time as all of these, which will probably be Friday. Um, if you didn't check out my last uh, report for different the earnings calls that happened uh, the week before last, then go and check that out because I wrote quite a lot, to be honest. So um, if you are interested in my thoughts on any of the stocks that I'm trading, that's probably the place to go and look. Um, so this week we have Take Two, Etsy, Disney, Activision Blizzard, and Qualcomm. There are a few others in the industry uh, that I may look at potentially, but those are the ones that I'm kind of looking at the most. Qualcomm, not super excited about since I did decide to close that position uh, at the start of last week as well. Finally, potentially what's going to take up all of my day on Tuesday, AMD are hosting another Horizon event. So the last time they hosted one of these events, it was to announce the Ryzen CPUs. That was back in 2016, I think, like early 2016, maybe April or something like that. Um, that was obviously a very, very big event. They've been advertising this uh, to their investors directly, so I would assume that they have something that they think is going to excite the investors to announce. Um, my theory is that it's going to be the GPU, um, because we, we know that that's meant to be coming in Q4. They still haven't announced it yet, so my theory is that that's what's being announced tomorrow, and perhaps we'll see the actual specs of that. What would really, really be good to see in terms of share price for AMD is if that card can compete with uh, Nvidia's uh, Nvidia's solution for servers, basically. So um, you're looking at competing with Nvidia's tensor cores at the end of the day. So that's that's what we really want to see. Um, I'm not super confident in that because <laughs> AMD's GPUs uh, have not been great for the past five years or so. But it is going to be a big event. So uh, I believe the whole thing's being live live streamed. I haven't really checked where it is yet. Um, but if you're interested in that, then go and check it out and feel free to post on my wall or in the comments of this video um, and let me know what you think about it. Okay, that does it for this week, guys. Thanks for watching again. You can keep up with me on my website, on Twitter, obviously on YouTube. If you're watching this video, you should probably subscribe. Uh, on Twitch, I do plan to get back to streaming at some point, but it's been like mega, mega busy recently. I'm looking at like new office space and all sorts of stuff. Um, and of course, on eToro. So thanks for watching, everyone, and I will see you guys next time.